called, I call it lossy updates, which is a little trick. And uh, what to do about a long, interrupting a long running process. So you want to be able to you know, interrupt something that's going on for a long time. So the two things I'm gonna, before I do, I'm gonna say I'm using something called uh, cyclic table probes, which I have on the tools network. This is very useful whenever you're looking at what happened because it can pick out the, uh, the messages as they come in, or the act, your states that actually act uh, as they happen. And that's the thing I'm gonna use. Uh, so what's a, uh, a message handler? Message handler is something that is stimulated by a message or an event, and then it handles it. So it's very, very, very clear. Uh, but often when you stimulate it, you wanna do something, that thing cascades, requires other things to happen. So often you change something, so you gotta recalculate something. You recalculate something, so you gotta change your display, your user interface. Or maybe you gotta do multiple things. So this is sort of a cascade of actions, or sub-actions that happen. And that's what I mean by a compound action. It's not just do action. It's do action, and all that means do these other things as well. So the, uh, this is the NI QMIX template. Uh, this is the 2013 <coughs> version. I think it's changed in 2014, 2015. Uh, it's a standard, it's called producer consumer, where this is basically just taking events and turning them into queue messages on this queue. And then this is the actual message handler. And this is the, this is the actual as it comes, I've made a few, uh, where uh, the initialized state, this is the initialized state, the first thing that executes, queues up a couple of other states after it. So this is an example. Initialize is often a compound action because there's so much you have to do on initialization. But even though, it's, this, I'm not just talking about initialize because often you have things that you actually have to do complex stuff and you end up doing the same thing, uh, queuing up other messages. Now this is the JKI template, which you know looks quite different. It's only got a single loop uh, in, and it's got a, it actually uses a, uh, a string to queue up actions. Here's the initialization uh, action, which queues up each line is a new action. And uh, it executes these actions, and when it runs out of actions to execute, it goes back to what it's called the idle case, and the idle case has an event structure. Now this is actually quite different and the difference is how the actions are uh, handled. So uh, you don't really see it normally when you handle an action. What you see is when you handle two actions at the same time, what happens. So let's make a race condition. Okay, so here's the, uh, the JKI template. I'll just show how it's uh, confirmed. It comes with some standard stuff, like you, you start it, you see an initial message. Can you read that initial message? You do something, it says do something, button pressed. So very simple. It's just kind of like a skeleton uh, of what you do. So now I actually encountered a structure very like this. It was homemade, but it was basically the same. Just two days ago, in a customer's code that I had to modify. And they had initialize, and then they had take measurement. And normally you initialize and then the user would push a button and take a measurement and it worked. But I wanted it to take a measurement automatically when it initialized because it's a useless step. And, I, and so what I did was I actually sent, send it, take measurement. So I'm gonna do a similar thing right here. By enabling, all I'm doing is sending the message something equivalent of pushing the button. And when I run this, <coughs> I'm going to read it, but yes, in here is initial message, not something. What happens to the something action? So if I wanted to debug this, I would use what I have, the, the uh, cyclic table probes. I find the actual message being received. And I put <coughs> on here, uh, it's called the string cyclic table. So when I run this, you can't read it. Maybe I can put this in. So what happens is you receive initialize, but initialize queues up these other initialized messages on the back. Something executes ahead of them. And because something relies on, uh, and then something sends update display on the back. And I think uh, initialize panel sends update display on the back. So you see these executed in such an order that something, if it depended on data, 
that's a bug right away because it's using uninitialized data. And the UI, because the UI for something, the update display happens before the update display is initialized, and so the UI gets out of whack. So this is a race condition that I've introduced only by doing a very obvious thing of just programmatically triggering an action. So before we go back to the queued message handlers, let's talk about sub-BIs, because sub-BIs is the gold standard of how you do stuff like that. Right, if I call two sub-BIs, sub-BI A may call its own sub-BIs, and they may call their own sub-BIs, it's sort of a, a tree. And if you look at what's the order of calling the, all these BIs, it's like this. A calls A1 and A2, but before A2 happens, A gets to execute its sub-actions. Uh, before B happens, all of A executes before all of B. And um, this is stack-like execution, not queue-like, right? A does not throw actions on the back of some kind of queue that happen after B, right? So this is very different than what the, uh, uh, the queue message handler template is doing. Uh, and if we look, again, for either sub-actions or the JKI, the advantage of the JKI is that it can handle things in a stack-like manner. Right? It handles things on the front of the queue, so it's like a stack, and it handles all of the actions for one thing before going on back to its uh, event structure to get some more stimulus for out of time. So the JPI state machine, or sub BIs, will execute like this. A will execute, B will execute. But the, uh, uh, the AI template and quite a lot of Qubit message machines, hand message handlers, which are like this, probably the majority I think I've ever seen, uh, execute like this. They throw on the back of the queue. And they throw on the same queue that the incoming stimulus is on. So if you do A and B, they will inter, inter, interlock like this. So if you do A and do B like that, this is how they execute. Uh, unless B was slightly delayed, in which case they might execute like this, or slightly more delayed, in which case you get more and more possibilities. Uh, here there's one possibility of what can happen. A can be abstracted. A can be described like a tree. I've indented it because it's, it's very clear what executes what after what. Here it's very unclear what happens. There's many places for possible race conditions. Uh, you can look at this as this is kind of like a protected or critical section. This will execute and cannot be interfered with by anything else from outside. Then this will execute and can't be interfered with. <coughs> if you think of some other uh, message, I have a set P for set parameter. So you're going to set some parameter that is used by these calculations done by A and B. Here, you can't change the parameter you know, in the middle of doing something. So if A1 uses this parameter and A2 uses the same parameter, they will see a consistent parameter. It won't be changed in the middle. It might be changed between A and B, but A and B are like independent actions. Here, changing the parameter happens anywhere, right? And it, and it can happen, so anywhere in here, there could be a poten potential for changing the parameter to cause a bug. And also what to realize is that many of these things are very rare bugs, they're race conditions. Uh, for example, here I've shown it, if it queued queued up A and B, there's a very, very slight chance that B could happen just between A and A1 and A2, sorry, A1 and A2. Could happen there, very, very small chance. So it's a very rare race condition, and that's kind of the worst bug because you can't really test for it very easily. So this is the kind of bug that someone calls you after you've deployed your code and say, every so often, it fails, and you can't figure out why. It's because of a very, very rare collision where you just hit between Two, uh, two actions. So this is much clearer. Here is only one place you've got to worry about things changing. Or two, really, I mean, between the two things. Again, okay. Uh, how much time do I have? Let me skip this uh, Quickly for the, the JK one, uh, something else I've modified so it does this set of A and B actions. So it actually shows the order that I showed on the overhead. And if I stop and share it. Here's a JKI version which I've modified to do the same. And I can put the same probe. And again, there, something, something else. Something else. And I don't know if you can see, this is all the JKI's initialization code. And then the something that I programmatically sent to it. 
And then when I do something else, I get all the actions, but I get all actions A before actions B. And it's not indented, but you have to indent this and see that it's very clear. So the summary of that is, you want to think about your actions, which are the big things that happen, and the handling of these actions is going to be like calling a VI. It's sort of a unified block that happens or doesn't happen, rather than this, this is a whole bunch of actions that get queued up and get fed back into the big queue with everything else. And that's my main point. Uh, but carrying on the sub-VI thought, uh, we're going to think about error handling in these compound actions. Often in, with, with sub-VIs, you chain sub-VIs. You have error chaining. So the error from one goes into the next. And at the end of the chain, which is sort of after the end of the compound action, you do your error handling. And as the error goes along, if you have an error somewhere deep in your uh, call stack, the error passes through. Each sub-VI then has the option to either do nothing, because it's an error, uh, execute anyway, because it's some kind of cleanup code, or do some kind of alternate action on error. And if you look at these, but neither of these templates really handles errors like this. In both cases, as soon as you have an error, you've got to handle it immediately. And your options are shut down, clear it, uh, which case you carry on possibly throwing more and more errors down your chain because you've got a problem. Uh, or clear the entire queue, which can also be problematic because then you're not doing any kind of shutdown code. So it, it's very beneficial to have this kind of behavior uh, in handling errors. It makes it much simpler. So I'm going to show the actual template that I use, which is derived from the JPI. But one of the main modifications is to account for this. And again, I've modified it to do exactly the same thing. see very well. This is actually the JPI kind of stretched out. So each the outer loop is for my major actions. Uh, each action starts with some kind of event, something from outside. Uh, then I can actually do follow-on actions, my sub-actions. It's the same kind of queue, except that I break the, uh, the, uh, the handling of error. I feed back the error through these actions. So if I do an action, do A, and there's an error, do B gets the error coming in. So I can feed the error through my sub-VIs in here and execute as if I was doing a bunch of VIs in a row with error chain. And then it's the setup so that the last case executed, which is the blank case, is the error handling at the end. So this will say something happens, do possibly a bunch of things, handle error. Something happens, do a bunch of things, handle error. And that's, I think, simpler than the way other queue message handlers handle error. Okay, now there's the third thing I'll talk about. It's called lossy update. Now often when, at least I do, the thing I do, <coughs> messages change things, and then I gotta update things. Particularly, you gotta update the display. But sometimes these are expensive. They take a long time. So what I have normally, you know, change something, update display, change something, update display. But sometimes I change a bunch of things. I don't wanna update display, update display, update display, update display, because that will cause a big lag. Uh, either displays or sometimes some kind of calculation. What I really want is, well, just update it when you're finished handling all the messages. So this structure here uh, does that. It uses a timeout case. You can do it with the right structure or a queue. The timeout case feeds back the timeout through a, uh, a default if unwired tunnel going to a feedback node to the timeout. So if anything happens, any other case is not connected, so this is zero. So any other event feeds back zero into the timeout, causing the, the, the timeout case to execute at the end of any set of, of events, but only execute once. And then you feed back your actual timeout from the timeout case. So you can actually, I usually use minus one, but if you want to have an actual timeout, you can put a number here. So this will always execute after any bunch, and it never actually falls behind. You can use a, an update that takes, you know, uh, 200 milliseconds, and even though you can throw events at it much faster than that, it will not back up. So I always find that to be very useful in these two message handles, keeping them processing their messages quickly. 
And I don't, it only works if it's something that doesn't have to be executed each time. But display is a, a great example of something that doesn't have to be executed. It's sort of like a notifier-like behavior. Okay, and the final thing I talk about, normally when I talk about this to people privately about uh, not being able to interrupt a reaction, they bring up the possibility that you're going to do a very long-running action and you need to be able to interrupt it. You need to be able to change things for the user interface. You need to be able to say stop. And uh, so here's an example of long-running action where I set up a measurement, start taking readings, and each reading is you know, a multi-step process. Uh, take reading, take reading, at some point I stop. And I want to be able to handle messages but I don't want to be able to handle messages everywhere. Right? If I handle messages everywhere, I've got to worry about race conditions, possibility of uh, bug everywhere. Uh, I want this to be protected, and the individual readings to be protected. So I don't want to change a parameter halfway between analyze and update and whatever. I want things to be consistent. Uh, what I want to be able to interrupt is during these wait steps. So I want to be able to, I don't want to, I don't put you know, a block around everything and I'm locked up and can't update anything. But I do think about where am I going to allow it to be interrupted. So just a very brief, what methods can you use to interrupt? The most common is to use a timeout. Uh, to use a timeout in your case, and timeout is this wait. Uh, that's simple, but it's a problem in that these methods just kind of <coughs> reset your timeout, and it's problematic. Uh, two other methods I'm going to briefly show is the, one is to have an external tiny, tiny source. That's some other loop that is sending you messages. You know, go, 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 go. So it's not really, it's not giving you an order, it's just, it's just waking you up. It's a trigger, it's a trigger, it's a trigger source. Uh, and the other one is to be able to send a delayed message to yourself. So that's okay, do it. Okay, send a message to myself in one second to do it again. So you keep triggering yourself. I didn't have time to actually do up a demo using a Q-state machine, but I have an example. Uh, this, by the way, is my, it's called Messenger Library, which is uh, the, the reuse code that I have. So here's an example with two periodic actions. Uh, one advantage of not using a timeout is timeout, you only get one timeout. But these other methods, you can use as many as you want. Right? They don't interfere with each other. Because you, know, you can have different ways. So, I'll make a lower one, uh, 100 milliseconds, the upper one. Right, and they actually count off at their own rate, if you can see that. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, put a probe on it. So again, these are just the messages. There's two actions, periodic action one and periodic. Yes, I'm coming to read it. <laughs> anyway, there's two different messages that are coming in and that this is executing. They're like timing sources. If I look at the two actions, are one is uh, this thing is a little, it launches asynchronously, but it's really just a loop. It's a loop that's just saying tick, 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 tick. And you can actually send it a message to change its tick rate. But basically, it's just saying you give it a message, this is recurring event one, and it sends it to you at a periodic rate. The other method is to send uh, recurring event number two, well, I just sent to myself. But in the handling of recurring event two, handling of recurring event two, I resend the same message to myself with a delay. So what this does is it launches an asynchronous thing that waits the period you ask and then sends the message. So this is, this is sending a message to yourself in the future to remind you to do something. It's like a, a calendar. You're registering the calendar to tell yourself in the future, to remind yourself to do something. And with these two things, you're, and again, everything is like you can interrupt during these waits. While you're waiting, you can handle anything else which is why I'm able to do two things at the same time at different rates here. Uh, how much time is that? Oh, very fast. Uh, any questions? Uh, well, that's the same with any machine. If you have if you have a case structure, 
and it takes 10 seconds to execute, there's no way to interrupt that. Uh, if I had that, I would either break it up. You can break it up into little things. Do step one, send a message to yourself to do step two. That's, that's deferring, you're allowing to be interrupted. But note that you're deciding where to do it. Done step one, it's safe to be interrupted now. I will defer. The other is, uh, if it's really long running, you, have, you can have what's called a helper loop, which is a separate loop that's doing it. And the message handling loop is the manager of the worker loop that's actually doing it. That's another, uh, another architecture way of doing things. I think the first picture you showed was the 2013. Yes. Yeah, I think they may have done some changes in 2013. They have in 2015. One is they removed the compound initialized state. Yeah. So that's great, but you're immediately going to reintroduce that as soon as you do anything complicated. Right? So it's, it's a race condition waiting to happen. Right? As soon as you have to know. You can use that structure. As long as you use sub for everything, yeah. right? you do not leave a case until you're done. Then that's fine. But you have to know that and you have to be disciplined. Yeah. And you'll be sub -BS. It's like branching the message wire yeah. and, and then on queue messages from a helper loop possibly. Yes. Yeah. Really, you should send a message to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Handle that message. Yeah. It requires discipline. You need to know this. Yeah. So I say that's a weak structure to give to beginners. JK is much better because it's harder to misuse it. Not that I haven't seen people who do the JKI misuse it. <laughs> and, and my deconstruction of the JKI is partly to make it clear. I'm actually restricting things. I'm trying to make you, you can only use it this way. Right? You can do fancy things with JKI. Uh, and I'm actually trying to exclude that. I want it, this is the way you use it. Any other questions? How many people use, how many people uh, send messages to themselves like that initial initialization case in the, in, in the NR template? <laughs> and do you do it without thinking about race conditions? Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> See, it's better to have a structure where it takes effort to defer. It's easy to write cases and say, I'll do, I'll do this, and then I'll do this, and then I'll do this. And not realize, well, this other thing could happen rarely, one time in 10,000, right in the middle, and that messes it up. And it's actually the, it's actually the one in 10,000 is worse than everything, right? You much rather have a bug that is immediately obvious, and your code just doesn't work, yeah. than the bug that will happen 1,000 in 10,000. Consistent bug with your head. Yeah, yeah but then you <laughs> fix it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say, like, I can't interrupt this process. Well, I'll immediately know that, and I'll fix it. I'll do something different. That's much better than a race condition. It can be a little bit tempting as well, depending on which version I'll be using. It can be quite tempting to say, well, this is my module. I'm just going to register to hear about every single event that that might be and just choose to handle certain ones. Yeah. Unfortunately, depending on which version you're using, if that event fires, if you're not handling it, yeah. it will still reset the timeout, and your timeout will never happen. That's also why I don't like using the timeout, because you've got to think about other things affect your timeout. <laughs> so you've got to think about timeout. You can actually use a timeout if every time you calculate the timeout. Mm -hmm. So rather than feedback a second as your timeout, you say, calculate, I am next due to do this in 30 milliseconds, feedback 30 milliseconds. If I get interrupted, like, well, I'm next due to do it in 25 milliseconds. You That's almost function. like having a timeout on your function. Yeah, you, you, can, like do, you can do it where it's uh, it's called, I call it a scheduler, I've done it a couple times, where it actually calculates. It knows, you say this should be done in, at this time, and every time you calculate the timeout, you say how long until that time, the next thing needs to be done. So, so then you so then use the time loop. You don't need to use the time loop. Because you that feed back the timeout. That's what, that's what calculate the time remaining. Yeah. Yeah. So then, just like what that should say, constant periodic. No, no, well, well, it is. But if something action in there takes longer, it will actually adjust then the delay until the next one. Mm -hmm. And if it overruns, yes, it yeah. will actually try and correct on the next schedule. Yes, but, so but that will be there's many ways you can do that. The, uh, the delayed message I had was actually a send message on next millisecond multiple. So it actually corrects for slight offsets. It's a periodic machine learning type. And you can always calculate, just record, I need it to happen yeah, on this millisecond. You just, what's the current time, feedback the difference yeah. into your time. 